Hey guys, welcome to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to cover diseases of the adrenal gland, and this is a two-part lecture. So this is going to be part one. In this one, we're going to start off by discussing Addison's disease or primary adrenal insufficiency and go over how to distinguish this from secondary adrenal insufficiency. We're also going to discuss here adrenal crisis, and um, then we will go over uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia at the very end, okay? And then in the next lecture, we will touch on Cushing's hyperaldosteronism and pheochromocytomas. So one thing I just want to point out is everything in this lecture and the next, everything in general, but specifically with respect to endocrine, these adrenal conditions are super high yield, okay? So make sure you know this stuff inside and out. Let's dive in. Let's get started with primary adrenal insufficiency, otherwise known as Addison's disease. Now, this disease is most commonly the result of autoimmune destruction of the adrenal glands, but hemorrhagic or embolic infarction infections, uh, particularly TB or meningococcus infections, are known to cause damage to the adrenals. Invasion by metastatic diseases are also possible causes. Now, when it comes to the signs and symptoms, the big one that you really want to be aware of is hypotension especially hypotension out of proportion to the disease state. Now, patients also commonly have hyperpigmentation. That's the result of increased ACTH that is seen in this condition. They frequently report anorexia, weight loss, nonspecific abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, myalgias, arthralgias. Those are all things you want to keep an eye out for with this condition. Now, lab abnormalities that you most definitely want to be aware of include hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, low aldosterone, eosinophils, and normocytic anemia. So the hyperkalemia here is a result of hypoaldosteronism because aldosterone causes the urinary excretion of potassium. And hyponatremia occurs as a result of increased ADH that's released in order to compensate for the hypotension that arises due to lower, due to lower cortisol levels. Okay, so that was primary. Now let's take a look at secondary adrenal insufficiency. Now remember, for the Step 2 CK exam, you're going to need to be able to differentiate between similar diagnoses. So I've added a few high yield points on how you can distinguish secondary from primary. So the primary disease is occurring at the level of the adrenal glands. The secondary is at the level of the pituitary. This means that anything that damages the ability of the pituitary gland to produce ACTH can cause secondary adrenal insufficiency. This includes adenomas, Sheehan syndrome, etc. You'll often see signs of a pituitary or a hypothalamic tumor if an adenoma is responsible, meaning you should expect to see a headache as well as visual field deficits. Now, patients also frequently report weight loss, nausea and vomiting, and they may be hypotensive but to a much lesser degree than patients who have the primary adrenal insufficiency. So that's something that's really important for you to remember. Now, here's where some big distinctions occur. Remember I said that an excess of ACTH is what's causing the hyperpigmentation of the primary renal insufficiency? While in secondary adrenal insufficiency, because ACTH is diminished, patients will not have hyperpigmentation. You'll also see less significant hypotension, like I mentioned, and no hyperkalemia. All right, these are all very, very telltale clues that will easily help you distinguish between primary and secondary, but you need to know them, right? If you don't know them, then it's a guessing game. But if you can recognize these differentiating factors, it's easy. Hyponatremia as a result of increased ADH compensating for the hypotension is also, of course, going to be expected. And there's also the potential of tertiary adrenal insufficiency. This would be uh, caused by chronic high-dose glucocorticoid therapy. So if you see that, Keep that in mind. All right, now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we diagnose primary versus secondary based off of ACTH levels. Now, this is established using a high dose ACTH stimulation test where the patient's given cosentropin and the basal cortisol and ACTH levels are measured. If basal cortisol is low and ACTH is elevated, then primary adrenal insufficiency is the cause. If basal cortisol is low and ACTH is low, then we're dealing with either secondary or tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Now, treatment of primary adrenal insufficiency includes glucocorticoid replacement, usually uh, hydrocortisone, plus mineralocorticoid replacement with, flu with uh, fludrocortisone, as well as androgen replacement with DHEA. Secondary adrenal insufficiency would be treated with glucocorticoid replacement using hydrocortisone. Additionally, 
patients should always be instructed to increase glucocorticoid doses during febrile illness by two to three times until the illness passes. I don't know that you will need to know that specifically for this exam, but that's something that you definitely want to remember. Now, if someone with any of these conditions that we've been covering encounters a significant stressor, uh, we could develop a life-threatening emergency known as an adrenal crisis. All right, and in an adrenal crisis, patients develop hypotension, fever, nausea, vomiting, as well as abdominal pain. Lab findings are going to be dependent on the cause of your adrenal crisis here. Now, you can expect low cortisol. You could expect ACTH to be elevated, normal, or low, depending on the cause of the disease. Now, the diagnosis of adrenal crisis will be confirmed with an ACTH stimulation test after treatment. You're not going to wait for the results to come back to begin treatment. So if you suspect adrenal crisis, you immediately want to go to your ABCs, right? Secure an airway, breathing, circulation. You'll immediately gain IV access. You'll draw labs. You'll bolus two to three liters of normal saline. You give a loading dose of hydrocortisone followed by maintenance doses and identify any possible infection and treat it appropriately. Management will, of course, include first establishing IV access. We do that with large bore needles. Then we can draw blood for immediate serum electrolytes and glucose, as well as routine measurement of plasma cortisol and ACTH. All right, let's move on now to congenital adrenal hyperplasia, a condition you've studied a ton for your step one. Now, we're not going to go into super detail here because you should know this stuff really well, but let's do a review. So, of course, we've got our three main enzyme deficiencies that we need to know. We've got the 21 hydroxylase deficiency, which is by far the most common form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This makes up over 90% of cases. With this enzyme deficiency, you'll see decreased cortisol, increased androgens, and decreased aldosterone, which will clinically appear as hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. You also want to be on the lookout for ambiguous genitalia in female patients. Now, you may also be asked which hormones will be found in excess in the case of a 21-hydroxylase deficiency, and that would be 17-OH progesterone because this hormone is broken down by 21-hydroxylase. Then we have the 11-hydroxylase deficiency. Now, whereas with the 21-hydroxylase deficiency, we got an excess of 17-OH progesterone, an 11-hydroxylase deficiency will lead to an excess of 11-deoxycorticosterone. That is a weak mineralocorticoid. Patients who have this enzyme deficiency have decreased cortisol levels, decreased aldosterone levels, and increased androgen levels, and they will present with hypertension and, in females, ambiguous genitalia. The last step is the 17-hydroxylase deficiency. This is going to result in a decrease in cortisol and androgens, but an increase in mineralocorticoid levels. Now, patients here will be hypertensive and hypokalemic, and all patients, regardless of their biological sex, will present as phenotypic females. Now, genetically male patients will have a blind vagina, meaning it comes to an end, as well as undescended testes. This is usually discovered when the patient presents with primary amenorrhea. All right, let's do some content review questions, and then we'll jump on to part two. So here's your first question. I'll give you 20 seconds on the clock. Make sure you uh, figure this one out and then come on back. Correct answer here is A. Next question. 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got it figured out, come on back. Correct answer here is D. And your final question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock, but if you need more time, go ahead and hit that pause button. Once you got it figured out, come on back. Correct answer here is B. All right, that is the end of Adrenal Glands Part 1. I will see you guys on the next lecture.